Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Dina Khoury. I am professor of history at George Washington University. And I want to welcome you all to, for the, to this, uh, uh, what I hope to be a very uh, interesting and informative session uh, that, uh, and we, in which we will be hearing from uh, Professor Zahra Ali, who will be speaking to us on uh, women and the Iraqi uprising. I'd like to briefly introduce our, um, our uh, distinguished speakers today and then uh, turn the, the floor to Professor Ali, who will speak to us uh, about her work, and then to Professors uh, Nadia Ali and, um, and Dr. Yasmin uh, Shelmiran, who will be commenting on uh, Professor Ali's um, uh, presentation. Uh, Professor Ali is assistant professor of, of sociology at Rutgers University. Her book, Women and Gender in Iraq, Between Nation Building and Fragmentation, is a groundbreaking study of women's activism in post in, before but also in post-invasion Iraq and is based on two years of ethnographic research uh, in, the, in Baghdad, as well as in Abil. Uh, Nadia Ali is prof Robert Family Professor of International Studies and Professor of Anthropology and Middle East Studies at Brown University. She has authored, as many of you know, many books uh, but her work uh, uh, and her research interests revolve around feminist activism and gendered mobilization with a focus on Iraq, Egypt, Lebanon, Turkey, and the Kurdish political movement. Uh, I will mention um, one particular book that we've used, a lot of us have used in our teaching, uh, one that is an edited and co-authored book, co-edited book with Deborah Najjar entitled We Are Iraqis, Aesthetics and Politics in the Time of War, which won the 2014 Arab American Book Prize for Nonfiction. Professor Al Ali is on the advisory board of Call, a journal of body and gender research and has, in, uh, has been involved in several feminist organizations and uh, campaigns transnationally. Dr. Yasmin Shelmiran uh, is, uh, joined the Swedish Institute of International Affairs Middle East program as a postdoctoral fellow in late 2020, where she is conducting research on women's participation in peace building in both Iraq and Syria. Dr. Shelmiran completed her PhD in 2020 2020 at Monash University's Center for Gender, Peace and Security in Australia. Her doctoral research focused on women's participation in peace building in 2003, uh, post 2003 Iraq. Um, uh, I, I'm, our panelists are uniquely qualified to talk and comment on women's activism in Iraq. And so I turn the floor to uh, Professor Ali um, uh, to begin the presentation. And Professor Ali will speak for 20 minutes. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dine. Thank you, uh, Tari, for organizing this event. Uh, it's really uh, an, an honor, and I'm, I'm so excited actually to, to have Nadia. Uh, with Nadia, we, we had a, a special book talk together at Brown, uh, and, and Yasemin as well, and, and Dine. I mean, it's, it's really rare that we have uh, scholars uh, uh, who have dedicated uh, some time and some really amazing research on Iraq. And, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's such a great opportunity for me to discuss not only my book, but also more recent developments. So, what I'm going to do uh, is to talk a little bit about my book, uh, just for those of you who uh, are not familiar with my work. Uh, but then I will connect it more to, I mean, the title of, of, of this event, which is uh, Women in the Iraqi Uprising. And I'll try to give you an idea of, of also how I, I'm, I'm, I am currently trying to analyze uh, women's massive involvement in, 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 in the October uh, 2019 uprising. So I'm going to uh, share my screen. 
uh, just because it makes uh, <laughs> it is better for you to see images rather than only people talking. Uh, so, right, let me open the screen. So, um, often when I talk about my book, I start uh, by describing it um, as uh, a her story of Iraq. Um, as it tells the story of Iraq from the point of view of women, and uh, especially women who happen to be activists. So it is a book about feminisms uh, in Iraq, feminism with an S, and it, also, it is also a book, a feminist book about Iraq. So although I use a lot of historical material, this her story is very much based on uh, in-depth interviews with women's rights activists and women who have had some political activism. Uh, I spend a very long time interviewing uh, um, over 100 women activists from different backgrounds, so from different political, economic, social, as well as, as ethnic, religious and sectarian background, from uh, activists who were at the time when I interviewed them in their 20s to uh, much older activists who were in the 70s. Uh, so uh, what I try to do is really to provide a, an oral uh, her story of Iraq and also to provide an intersectional or relational analysis of issues of women, gender, state, uh, nation, and religion. So I mainly engage with transnational and post-colonial feminist debates to understand how do these categories exist in relation to each other? How do these in intersections work in different uh, period of time? Uh, how women's economic, social, and political experiences allow us to make sense of these categories as well. So as, um, as I develop it in the book, feminist history or her story <laughs> is in Iraq is as diverse, heterogeneous, contradictory as any other feminist her story in the world, right? Um, and there has been uh, different trends of feminist activism in Iraq. I mean, in the 50s, for example, uh, there's, a, there's some literature that talks about the fact that the two main trends of feminism were, uh, let's say, the, the leftist uh, feminist trend and also the nationalist feminist trend. Uh, and uh, uh, many emphasize on the fact, and I, I do that in the book as well, uh, that up to uh, uh, the, the, the beginning of the 80s, uh, the leftist feminist trend was, was really dominant. And that really also played a role uh, in the ways in which uh, the personal status code, that is a, a legal frame that gathers so-called family matter, issues such as marriage, uh, inheritance, divorce, uh, child custody. So really the fact that uh, uh, the dominant feminist trend in Iraq was very leftist close to the communist party played a role in actually shaping uh, uh, um, women's legal rights. Um, so in the book, I really explore women and feminist experiences of authoritarianism, war, I talk about uh, the Iraq-Iran war, the, the, the 91 war, and also very importantly, I think, uh, about the sanctions. Uh, and of course, I mean, uh, uh, the, the most important part of the book is dedicated to uh, the post-2003 uh, context, so the context following uh, the US-led invasion and occupation. And I try to do, I mean, many things, of course, I cannot do, go into details here, but I try to engage uh, or start a, a reflection on the relationship between, let's say, the structural and the political, in the sense that the question is, what do women's rights mean in a context of not only armed violence, but also of structural violence? Uh, the, the very collapse of the state that started in, in the 1990s with the sanctions that were indeed, I mean, an invisible war, as rightly put by uh, Joe Gordon in, in her book, means it means the collapse of vital institutions, vital infrastructures that are really central to living a functioning and healthy life, right? Uh, health infrastructures, education, basic services. And in the, in the 90s, really, 
the regime also implemented very conservative gender politics and uh, the very realities of the sanctions with a society uh, um, that was living on a survival mode also really redefine uh, the social fabric. Uh, gender relations and practices um, really, uh, I mean, it really exacerbated an already existing patriarchy and conservative ideolo ideologies. And I think it's important to start there rather than just to start after 2003, because it's a process that really started in the 90s. And so, um, since 2003, women and feminists had to deal with uh, the continuation of this state collapse and also a politicization of sectarian and gender identities. And here I think that actually using uh, um, one of my friend and colleagues con concept, Maya Migdashi, her concept of sectarianism is actually very relevant in the sense that uh, the post-2003 political uh, system is not only based on sectarian divisions, but also really on sexual divisions. So it's, it's not only a sectarian political system, it is a sectarian political system. And so one of the examples uh, to kind of uh, uh, back up this argument is that the very first uh, um, legal reform that was actually um, um, uh, tried by the uh, political parties that came in power with the US invasion uh, uh, that dominated the central government, the Shia Islamist, very conservative parties, is in 2003 to actually uh, question the personal status code. I mean, first it was to abolish the personal status code and put in place a sectarian based personal status code. I mean, the current personal status code uh, that was uh, uh, established in uh, uh, in the 50s, in 59, 1959, and that is still in place in Iraq, is based on both Sunni and Shia jurisprudence. So one of the first legal reform that was attempted by this, uh, this new political elite that came in 2003 was to really sectarianize the personal status code. And of course, this, this didn't work. However, uh, um, the, the, there's an article in the Iraqi constitution that was, uh, uh, that was um, vote, I mean, uh, put in place in 2005 uh, that still allows, actually, there, there is a possibility to, um, um, in the name of, of freedom of religion, to uh, put in place, uh, uh, I mean, sectarian or communal based uh, laws, including uh, personal or fam laws uh, um, uh, on, on family matters. So there, there has been like every year, every, every two, three years in Iraq, uh, attempts made by uh, mainly Shia Islamist parties uh, in power to uh, sectarianize the personal status code. The most recent attempt was uh, the Ja'fari law. And this is actually the picture of a demonstration against the Ja'fari law. So the Ja'fari law, uh, just to clarify, is, is supposed to be based on the Ja'fari uh, jurisprudence, that is the main uh, Shia uh, jurisprudence in Iraq. And one of its aspects is, for example, to uh, uh, allow, uh, um, because Sind al balagha in, in, in Ja'fari uh, jurisprudence is considered as nine years old, Sind al balagha is the age of maturity for girls. Uh, and so it would allow, for example, marriage, uh, for girls as early as nine years old, uh, whereas the legal actually age of marriage is 18 years old for both uh, men, men and women. Uh, and it could also allow very precarious form of, of marriages that is commonly uh, uh, named in Iraq, Zawaj is say it, so marriage outside of the courts, so the, uh, of the, the civil courts. So marriage, I mean, unions that don't uh, have any uh, uh, legal protection for women. So, so really feminists in Iraq have been you know, facing this sectarianism and one of the main, uh, uh, you know, uh, struggle uh, for them has, has been uh, around the personal status code. Another aspect uh, of, of uh, women's rights activism since 2003 is really uh, um, that feminists have also acted as substitutes of uh, the state institutions, uh, of the absence of state institution, of, of their collapse really, having to really deal with uh, uh, everyday needs, basic needs uh, for the society. 
Um, and also uh, um, because of, of the realities of, of the post-2003 period, and, and actually Nadia, you, you wrote extensively about that, there's, there has been uh, uh, investment of, of, of a lot of money, uh, and uh, money from uh, the US gover government, embassies and international organization to fund uh, women's rights and, and uh, organization and women's groups. So there has been, as it is the case in, in, in many parts of, of, of uh, I mean, in the region, there has been a form of enjoyization of women's rights activism, where really the, 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 these, the, the international programs and the agenda have really shaped uh, a, a women's activist agenda. So there's these two things I think happening together. There's, a, you know, on the one hand, you have women's rights organizations that are dealing with, you know, everyday needs and, and really dealing with these structural and infrastructural issues. And on the other hand, you also have, I mean, in order to exist when the state has collapsed, you also need to rely on a network of, of funds. Uh, so there also is this aspect of enjoyization. And one of the arguments that I'm uh, trying to make around uh, the, the rise of protest movements, I mean, it really started in 2011, then 2015, 2018 as well, and now more recently, uh, the October 2019 uprising, is that actually these various movements of protest pushed many feminists outside of their comfort zone. Right, because it's asking, it's it's really developing. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, political discourses uh, uh, that is, I mean, not concerned with what actually NGOs feminists do. For example, trainings and workshop around the CDAO or, or gender mainstreaming uh, workshop. On it is not focused on let's say legal, the legalistic aspects of, of of women's rights of women's lives. Right. It is con concerned with more uh, structural and infrastructural issues. And so, as many of you know, uh, the October uh, 2019 uh, uh, uprising is really this massive movement of protest that spread, spread across uh, the country, uh, developing mainly in uh, Iraq's Shia-dominated central and southern, uh, southern provinces, such as cities, uh, such as Najaf, Karbala, uh, Nasriya, and al Basra. And while initially launched by youth and, let's say, the disenfranchised, so people from very poor background, the uprising was quickly joined by people from diverse back backgrounds. So we had unions, uh, syndicates, uh, uh, student organizations that, uh, uh, you know, quickly joined the uprising. And one of the remarkable features of, of the uprising is really the strong uh, presence of women, especially young women. Uh, aligning with the uprising unifying slogan, and read Wapan, we want a country. And uh, the other slogan uh, was, Nazil Ahud Haqqi, I'm going down to take my right. And so the uprising is, is really not only addressing corruption and el the Muhasasa system put in place in 2003, which was really the focus, I think, of the 2015 um, uh, protest movement. But it is really demanding uh, functioning infrastructures and institutions, access to resources. It is really addressing structural issues as well as political issues. I mean, part of the demand were new elections, a new parliament, etc. And I argue in my most recent research that really the uprising constitutes uh, a rise against what, I, what Stefan Graham has uh, uh, theorized as uh, uh, herbicide, really the killing of the cities, and also rise against forms of necropolitics, uh, uh, such as the violence of the militias. Um, and it is demanding as well freedom, it's tackling societal, gender, and religious norms. And I think also that women's participation, uh, their really massive participation actually made this uprising a societal uprising. And actually, when I went to Tahrir Square at the time, uh, really people were talking about the fact that the women's present, presence made it, made it a societal present, as is the whole society was participating. And I guess what I'm going to talk about uh, is more... Uh, what happened, let's say, during the, 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 uprising, the uprising's highest moments, like the first two months of the uprising. Um, and of course, first of all, women's participation alone does not make it a feminist participation, first of all, that's an important point. And even less, it doesn't make the uprising a feminist uprising, that's for sure. 
but my argument here is more that um, women's participation, um, its meaning, its significance, its implication um, in what is maybe, I mean, the, the two months, as I said, is, is the moment that was really a social drama. To understand it, we have to look at space and the kind of space, discursive, imaginary and, and material space, actually, that the uprising has produced and also reclaimed. So first, the uprising as a predominantly urban phenomenon has produced a social space. Um, protesters have really reclaimed a space that since 2003 has been I mean, post 2003, let's say social space is militarized, it is male dominated, and it is also very importantly privatized, right? Um, and in producing an alternative social space that is public, that is also inclusive, and that is also away uh, from armed violence, claiming to be peaceful, um, women invested a space that can challenge dominant gender norms and they can also actively participate in building a non-patriarchal or less patriarchal social fabric. Um, the, the second point is, is that I wanna make here uh, is we have also to look at the nature of the repression of the uprising. And the repression was, I mean, and is still very gendered. Gender issues were very, very central. Uh, the parties in power uh, uh, that were, were, were trying to um, delegitimize this uprising uh, use a very moralistic gender discourse, saying that the uprising is immoral. There were so many things on social media, but also in political discourse that were saying that, for example, in the tents where people were living in Tahrir Square, uh, 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 girls and boys, they sleep together under the tents. There's all types of, of gender, um, uh, uh, of, of um, uh, immoral things that are, that are going on in Tahrir Square. And so uh, in response to that, actually, so this is an, another picture. I'm going to just move to uh, this picture. Uh, in response to that, actually, women, and especially young women, organize a protest in the frame of the uprising. And it's very interesting that this, the slogan uh, and the, the name of the protest was Banatak Ya Watan, your uh, young women, Ya Watan. So it's an emphasis also on the fact that it's the, the young generation of women that is participating in this uprising. And this Benatic Yawatan was turned in social media and in, 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 in many discourse. For example, the hashtag Benatic Yawatan on Twitter uh, was turned into Ahiratic Yawatan, right? So uh, to which women replied, and there were many banners, and you see it written here in, in Arabic, uh, uh, the women of Tashreen are revolutionaries. They are not prostitutes, right? We also saw, um, I mean, we all saw this video of this director of the girls' school uh, who was, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, the girls, I, I think it was um, a secondary school uh, uh, in, in Baghdad, actually. So the young uh, girl students, they uh, left, uh, they wanted to leave the school to go to Tahrir Square. And the director of the school was uh, screaming in a, in a very <laughs> funny, funny voice, Ab, you know, the word Ab, uh, in, in the sense, you know, gender mixing is ab. it's ab for women to go and, and demonstrate and so this ab in the voice in the funny voice of this uh, of this director of this male uh, school director was uh, made fun of over and over and over again during the uprising uh, of course this this uh, this uh, this um, uh, slogan for example la la mu'awra salt al mar thawra so uh, it's not ab, it's not shameful. The woman's voice is actually a revolution. So this is these these is uh, these are examples of, of of how the repression itself was gendered and how the response to this gender uh, uh, um, discourse was uh, subversive. Uh, um, another example would be for ex uh, uh, some of you are familiar with the. Um, Safa Serai, who is one of the main uh, uh, figure and, and martyr of early martyr of, of this shaheed of this uprising. And so uh, Safa Serai used to be called Ibn Senwe. So he used to be called in reference to his, mo his mother, Senwe. Uh, 
And so it uh, has been uh, something that is very recurrent in Tahrir Square to uh, um, designate uh, uh, protesters and, and, and so-called revolutionaries uh, in reference to their mother's name as opposed to their father's name. Um, so those are examples of, 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 of gender, uh, uh, of very uh, gender transformative uh, uh, discourses and practicing uh, practices during the uprising. Um, but then, of course, uh, I mean, I, I guess now there's this question of the absence of a feminist or a woman-centered agenda, agenda in the uprising. Apart from some individuals and groups, uh, um, there were, for example, there was only one tent in Tahrir Square uh, that was dedicated to women. It was the tent of the women of the uprising. Um, and um, I mean, it was individuals and, and let's say network that were close to uh, the organization of women's freedom in Iraq. That is a pretty radical woman, women's group. However, the rest of the feminists, uh, um, were under another tent that was very, very visible uh, uh, in Tahrir Square. It was right under uh, Nasb al-Tahrir, so the, the big sign uh, in the middle of the square. And it was uh, Al-Khayam al iraqiyya so the, 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 the tent, uh, the Iraqi tent, right? So most uh, uh, um, activists from the Iraqi Women's League, the Iraqi Women Network were under that tent. And actually, when I went there and, and, and tried to discuss and and, and say, well, uh, don't you think there is a need also uh, for uh, a woman-centered agenda? There was uh, sometimes a very aggressive response. No, this is, this is the nation's uprising. This is the uprising of Iraq, and we don't want, it, we don't want to make it uh, gender-specific. So um, one of the arguments that I'm making to make sense of that is that women's predominant choice to frame their participation as nationalistic, rather than feminist is a function of the dominant frame that is available to them and through which they negotiate their participation as any other social group. And to make this argument, I've, I've been inspired by Nermin Alam's uh, work on actually uh, um, women uh, participation in the Egyptian uprisings, where she makes this argument that this nationalistic discourse uh, put forward by women and by people in the uprising was very colorless, right? It was putting forward a unifying, quite homogenizing sense of nation, belong, uh, nation belonging. So it's, it's a discourse about al watan that does not only erase women as a social group, but also erases class-based struggle and other, let's say, uh, social group specific issues, right? So women along other social groups predominantly chose to align behind the unifying slogan Nrid Watan, expressing demand for a new political system based on equity, with functioning institutions providing services, jobs, and opportunities, um, also demanding freedom, both religious, political freedom, uh, also justice for those killed during the peaceful protest. And this demand, vague in general, made it possible for women uh, and men from uh, different social and ideological backgrounds to come together without having to deal with the more divisive issues. So of course, there's the question, did women miss an opportunity to defend a woman-centered agenda? Uh, the uprising, especially in the first weeks, as I said, it, it was a, a social drama, a liminal space, um, that produce, and I'm, I'm very here inspired because I'm, I'm talking about faith by, by Henri Lefebvre uh, as uh, theorization, it was producing heterotopies, right? Discursive, material, and imaginary space that would, should allow social expressions that are in usual space and time stigmatized and impossible. And I think that the uprising, especially during the first two months, was also that. So one could, argue that it was an appropriate moment to put forward a more radical feminist agenda for women. However, I would say that the significance of Iraqi women's participation in the uprising is a product of their intersectional positionality. As male Iraqis are facing challenges based on class, sex, religion, etc., women are facing, on top of everything, 
patriarchal oppression. They have to bargain with patriarchy, to use Denise Condiotti's terms, and negotiate within and against the already existing militarized, male-dominated and privatized social space. And so the social drama and liminal space of the protest allow them, as for other social groups, to actively participate in the weaving of society's social fabric. And as such, it can be possible for them to weave a non-patriarchal social space that is inclusive, that is free, that is less hierarchical in terms of class, sect, and gender. Because the uprising was also this moment of coming together, of negotiating a, a new social contract. And as Henri Lefebvre has argued, it is not the revolutionary movement that produces the space but the eruption of the heterotopic spaces themselves that create something different and alternative from the dominant power. So women's participation in the uprising itself, in action and its, it, in its diverse expressions and experiences, both individual and collective, uh, I think has produced an alternative space to this, as I said, militarized, male-dominated and privatized dominant isotopic space uh, and the visible participation is perhaps not gender or non-gender specific but it is nevertheless inclusive and transformative and I will stop here. Wonderful well thanks so much uh, Zaha I mean I think what uh, makes your work so compelling is um, the combination of very in-depth empirical groundedness and um, theoretical cutting edge analysis. Um, so the comments that I'd like to offer today um, really link to the specific historical moment. I've over the last few weeks been involved in several panels that in one way or another try to mark the 10 years of Arab uprisings um, and mm. clearly you know this discussion is part of of this wider commemoration and the question you know how should we think about this period mm. and um, I think one of the important points that is uh, sort of emerged out of these discussions is that it's very important to not think about the past 10 years whether we focus zoom in on Iraq or the region more broadly in terms of a snapshot but it's very important to historicize uh, mm -hmm. protest. And so I think your work does that beautifully. Um, and of course, I agree with you, even, you know, even the project of writing about women and gender in Iraq post 2003 required historicizing, you know, mm -hmm. the, the 35 years of Ba'ath regime, economic sanctions, uh, the various wars. But also if you look specifically at protests and if you zoom in on the 2003 period, it is very important to have this more long durée approach to protests and also see how it actually shifted over a period of time and how the role of women and gender shifted. Um, the other uh, point when we look comparatively at protests in the region is um, also what you describe the centrality of gender-based claims and the centrality mm. of body, poli body politics in mm -hmm. protests. And the fact that, um, yes, I mean, we might have a range of different gendered claims and often it is not feminist explicitly. Sometimes it is really just about women being there, taking up the space and, you know, visibility presence. Uh, but sometimes, and I mean, I've heard you also talk about this in, in um, you know, previous talks. It is also about, in the Iraqi context, young women saying, well, you know, we want to live. We want to just, you know, mm. enjoy ourselves. Mm. And so that, uh, you know, uh, gender politics on that level, it's not on the sort of big political level of changing laws and, you know, constitution, but on the level of you know, give us a chance, let us be, you know, let us just live normal lives as, as teenagers or young women anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. That that is as much part of the protest as is an intersectional approach. And I very mm -hmm. much agree with you that when you look at feminist mobilization in Iraq, um, that feminists have been at the forefront of challenging authoritarianism, militarism, mm -hmm. sectarianism, but, 
clearly when we look at the protests that was not uh, just mm. a matter of sort of feminist activists being involved but you know mm. women on a much broader scale and you know across different generations mm. um i think that the the question though you know whether it's a mischance or not that's a really tricky one mm -hmm. and uh, you know when we look at um again if you look comparatively at what happened in other contexts you know looking at egypt uh, looking at Libya, Tunisia, um, we see that um, there's sort of this similarities that there are these liminal spaces where you say, you know, it's a, it's a, this unifying spaces. Uh, Tahrir Square, I mean, we just had the 25th of January on Monday, where of course, you know, everyone mm. who participated in Cairo, Medan Mid Tahrir, describing the space, this unifying space, and we were not there as women, we were there as Egyptians, as citizens, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So very similar to what you're describing. Um, only what happened then, of course, a few weeks later when the Egyptian women went to International Women's Day, 8th of March, and a small group of them went to the same space, uh, you know, were attacked by men. Mm. So I think that, you know, one of the things we need to look at more carefully uh, is you know, the question of, so what allows this mm. almost suspending mm. of, I mean, you say mm. sort of less to no patriarchal uh, inequalities and, you know, no harassment, you know, mm. at this specific moment and why it so easily changes when women actually do make gender specific claims. And mm. maybe that's not always the case, but I think it's, um, of course, historically, we have seen in many um, revolutionary contexts that spaces are open, opening up for women. I think maybe the space where it definitely has been different is in Lebanon, where I think when I look at the kinds of slogans, um, sort of young women and feminists and also queer feminists have been able to be sort of much more outspoken in terms of their specific demands. But again, then you know it's it's always this balancing between you know trying to compare and 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 see wh where there are maybe commonalities uh, but also clearly very different historical uh, and uh, contemporary context political context and spaces um, i mean I, i'm very much aware that you know, the feminist movement in lebanon is very very different uh, from iraq but i guess what i'm trying to say is that is probably one example where, you know, women were very much out there, not just as women, but as feminists and also as queer activists. Um, I think that finally, I'd just like to offer a few comments on, on the backlash. Um, I mean, you mentioned Denise Candiotti in terms of patriarchal bargain. I mean, the other concept that she coined, which I find really useful is that of masculinist restoration. And I think there are different shades of that or different forms of that we see unfolding so that it is not a coincidence that the repression and the backlash against the various forms of protests whether in Iraq in Egypt uh, in Tunisia and Libya that they are so gendered as you describe them and that you know women are being the the way to discredit women is to call them prostitutes or you know to get them to undergo forced virginity tests or to sexually harass them um, and so you know this is not a coincidence there is clearly a pattern here um, and i think this sort of idea that patriarchy as usual is under threat a bit and i mean i would say in iraq probably not as much as in some other places in the region but still that we you know we see that the sort of the backlash, the resistance is very gendered, is what she calls a masculinist restoration. And so the, the, the violence very much targeting women, very much around you know, their bodies, their sexuality. Um, and I think that you know, one of the many issues that has emerged is that of also contestation of masculinity. Um, and I think that one of the sort of rays of hope uh, if we take the sort of long durée approach and um, clearly one of the things that we have to think about a lot is the impact of COVID-19. We know that everywhere in the world, including in Iraq, it has 
contributed to an increase in gender-based violence and increase in domestic violence as it has contributed to women being disproportionately affected in terms of access to resources, employment, healthcare, and so on. But I think, you know, when, when going back to sort of rays of hope is that it seems to me that in Iraq, as elsewhere in the region, um, more and more young men start to realize that um, gender-based claims and gender-based violence has to be part and parcel of a sort of wider vision of a different society. Um, of course, historically, women have always been told to wait their turn and, you know, been told, well, you know, let's first address the big issues. But I am, you know, I am inspired by the fact that um, while we do see increases in gender-based violence, we also do see a growing member of young men being interested in learning and also, you know, being committed to um, fight gender-based violence and committed to make gender-based claims and violence part and parcel of the wider political struggle, just as, you know, feminists are, have become quite, um, not sectarian, <laughs> intersectional in, in the struggle. So yeah, I'm going to leave it here and uh, hand it over to Yasmin. <clears throat> Thank you, Nadia. Thank you, Zahra. Uh, thank you also to Tari for organizing this and for uh, including me. I think it's such a such a pleasure to be part of this panel and to contribute um, as best I can. Uh, I'll try and make some points that haven't already been covered, but you both have done such a good job of covering so many different issues that I think are so relevant, and particularly in uh, contextualizing uh, these protests in a much longer term view of uh, women's participation of the gender politics in Iraq, even predating 2003. Um, and so what I'll try and talk to briefly is maybe just looking specifically at women's civil society and uh, what this means in terms of understanding the participation of women in the protests, but young women in particular. Um, I'll try also to touch on maybe hoping to look forward a little bit uh, in the short term as well as the long term, but I also hope that uh, in the question time, if there's time for that, that we'll hear from some of the attendees because I think they'll have some really interesting insights and uh, things to say about what's going on in the, in the coming months and the coming years as well. Um, so the first thing uh, to say is I guess I would like to in my own research, I've looked very much on women's civil society in Iraq after 2003, of course, thinking about the things that happened beforehand as well. Um, but I would often hear some comments from the people I was interviewing about the sorts of impact that the context, uh, the political context and the security context as well, would have on women's participation at large and women's civil society in particular, which is that it would become very siloed. Um, so you have these specific spaces where women activists or civil society or even the parliamentarians that would gain access to these new political spaces uh, where women were able and allowed to participate and spaces where they didn't have access to, regardless of the gains that were kind of enshrined in the, in the constitution and in other um, legal or political spaces as well. So yes, you see women in parliament. And of course, you know, as, as uh, cynical as a lot of commentators can be about the quota, uh, we do have to acknowledge how hard won that space was. Um, but what you see is, well, there is, uh, you know, access to some ministerial positions, some parliamentary positions that doesn't equate into access into the rooms where really important decisions about security, economy, that the shape of the state were, were being made. Um, and you can say somewhat the same thing about civil society to a degree. You know, you see these huge strides, this development of a, a women's groups around the country that work on different contexts. Um, but this, there is a limitation in terms of the spaces where women's civil society can have its impact and they are very rooted in women's issues or gender specific issues. And of course, this is no indictment on women's civil society groups at all. This is a, a nature of the conflict context, the fact that these groups exist in a space where the state isn't doing its job. Um, but also that they're responding to, you know, 
two decades of crisis after crisis after crisis, where they are the ones at the front line of humanitarian relief, of service delivery around the country and in many different contexts. So, you know, these groups, if they don't step up to mobilize against the challenges, even the ones that Zahra mentioned as well around the personal status co uh, code, these things don't become addressed. So, of course, uh, the spaces where women's civil society has had to occupy means that uh, perhaps there's not the ability or the, uh, the, uh, the, the possibility or the opportunity to, to kind of address some of the wider political issues that exist in Iraq. Um, what I found in my own research as well is that there's also a, a lack of cohesion sometimes, and this is linked very much to the, this phenomena of NGOization, or you can call it uh, projectification of the women's movement and women's civil society as well. There are many organizations, they exist in many different contexts, as well as at the national level, and also amazing programs that are put together, they have this theory of change that's really compelling, but because of the nature of how civil society has to exist, how they are funded, how they access, you know, the very thing that allows them to continue on in their work means that you have an amazing project for something like 12 months, maybe two years. And at the end of it, that momentum is lost. And we're not really sure what happens to the, the women that were trained, that took part, that led uh, that particular project. So I see that as kind of some of the issues that exist for women's civil society in Iraq and some of the barriers that, uh, those very same women face in their, in their activist work. So to me, when we think about that, uh, the protests in October onwards and the different roles that women take uh, in those protests mark a, a bit of a difference when it comes to that because women in those protests are very much enmeshed in the many aspects of the revolution rather than occupying specific uh, claims based on women's rights or gender claims, if we want to call them that. So you see, um, this is some maybe a trope that comes up in some analysis on uh, women's participation in other revolutionary movements. You do see women playing some traditional caregiving roles, you know, the, the spaces around cooking or feeding people or providing other forms of care, as well as embodying more traditional uh, notions of femininity or, or motherhood, for example, in Iraq as well. So, you know, this this image of the, the mother who must always endure the loss of her children uh, was definitely there in some of this movement and, and some of the mobilization around that. But you also see women uh, acting in much broader roles as well, um, at the front lines, as medics, as organizers and leaders, and even uh, rhetorically challenging and engaging religious figures when they questioned uh, whether they had the right to be there in the very first, in the first place or whether they had the right to have these mixed uh, experiences and, and, and presence in the squares. So while we see women mobilizing as women, that was mainly to protect their own presence in the squares where they were in and when that came into question. But in large part, women really mobilized as young Iraqis who had these egalitarian, more justice-driven views about their homeland, but also very simple demands around, you know, access to public space, access to cities and urban centers, uh, the right to kind of have community and, and to be there in public and security as well. So the very simple demands and they were able, you know, one of the beautiful things is that you're able to see that in moments that it's achieved like almost a state within a state uh, where it functioned the way a state is supposed to um, in a maybe in a romanticized sense, but I think it is important that that experience happened. Um, so yes, that existed, but I also think in part this participation is a reaction to maybe 17 or 18 years now of post-invasion order or disorder um, and all of the things that have happened since and the lack of visible or tangible results um, from that same political order, which unfortunately does include civil society as well, because it's just so difficult to, to build that momentum. Um, what I want to touch on very briefly is, uh, I suppose, this idea of what we might do if we look a little forward in both a very practical and maybe short term sense, but also in a long term sense as well. I don't know if uh, I'm best placed to uh, talk about all of the different things that are relevant under this umbrella, but I hope I can put some questions forward. And if others want to contribute in question time, it would be really great. Um, some of the things that uh, Nadia also touched on as well is this 
idea of uh, how to carry on that momentum or, you know, this idea of, okay, we've allowed the, sus uh, the suspending of a patriarchal order in a moment in time. Um, and my question is then how do we, how do we carry that forward? Or how can you see that realized into a new order that's more long lasting? In a very practical sense, um, I suppose there's a lesson to be learned in looking at other transition moments or revolutionary moments in other parts of the world, in the region, but also much further abroad, around this uh, common experience, unfortunately, where you see women taking up leadership positions in, in movements, uh, taking up space in movements, but then after the fact, it becomes very hard to cement that into something that uh, is institutionalized, is, is more formalized. And then of course, in moments where you do have those things institutionalized, where you do have a quota or something like that, it's, it's hard to see that translated into the day-to-day -day life that people have to lead, which I think is exactly where uh, this revolution and the different demands that people took part in it, uh, that's where this frustration comes from. So now uh, in a short-term sense, we're seeing you know, political parties forming these demands, hardening or formalizing under certain platforms, political platforms. And I'm curious to see what presence women will have as, as we move towards the election and possibly later in the year. And also what presence gender issues will have in these platforms, whether they'll, they'll be on these agendas, what, what they'll look like and so on. Um, I think something to keep in mind very briefly as well is, is the idea that this is extremely dangerous work for women, unfortunately. And this is not a new thing. It's not something that's happened just in the last year, but symbolically, violence that's enacted symbolically on women's bodies in Iraq has been, has been instrumentalized by the state, by militias, by different actors for a very long time, uh, predating 2003 and certainly onwards. Um, but it's always very heartbreaking to see just how often this happens and how this has ramped up in the last year or so. I mean, only two days ago, another activist was attacked in, in Baghdad after uh, appearing on a television uh, news show. So it's something that I think we have to think about and as maybe someone sitting on the outside uh, trying to champion and being hopeful of, of all the wonderful things that women are doing, it's something to keep in mind as well, um, that this is dangerous work. I think longer term, uh, I'm curious about what this spells out for Iraqi civil society, what it means for uh, new generations that are coming in. And something that's been a bit of a bright light uh, for me that I haven't seen discussed too much is how um, there's certain actors that really stepped up in terms of their role uh, in thinking about uh, you know, you know what, what makes up a functioning healthy democracy and a functioning healthy civil society. So I think seeing uh, the different unions come up and really mobilize their membership to, to show up, but also to really think about what, what is the vision for, for Iraq after this happens, that to me is a really a, a hopeful sign of, of uh, possibly a new space where we can see women, uh, young women, uh, step up, uh, maybe take some new leadership roles, and maybe even reshape the way civil society has done its work in the last two decades or so. I might uh, leave it there as well so that we have time for some discussion as well, but uh, thank you. Thank you all for this, uh, these fascinating um, uh, presentations, and I think what I'd like to do now is, <clears throat> uh, unless Zahra wants to respond to specific uh, points, perhaps open it up for, for the audience. Zahra, do you want to start or should I open it up, do you think? The, the, uh, I would like to say a few things, but, the, but I'm looking at the time. And mm -hmm. so, so maybe we should just, you know, allow for the question and, and perhaps at the end, I'll, I'll, I'll give a general response. Uh, I, I see um, uh, Amanda just told me that we can go on as long as we want. So you, you have time if you want to respond, Zahra, and then we might want to open it. Okay, so uh, I mean, one one thing that I wanted to say <clears throat> is on on gender. I mean, uh, thank you, thank you so much, and idea. Th thank you so much, yes. I mean, they were, I mean, all brilliant uh, remarks and comments, and and actually, um, the comment on on gender based violence is something that I'm thinking of a lot these days, <clears throat> and partly the uprising has led me to try to to 
I mean, I think we need to theorize and re-theorize also the way we talk about gender-based violence, because often um, I and, and, and other scholars do, we, when we talk about gender-based violence, we're often talking about women, right? And we also forget that, um, I mean, men also are gendered. So how do we make sense? And it's something that also I thought of when I was in Tahrir Square. And when I heard a lot of young women saying, um, we're coming to Tahrir because we want to support and read Nisnid Shababna, right? We want to support our, our young men in the sense that because the October uprising quickly became, I mean, it's kind of goal kind of shifted at some point after the, 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 the crazy uh, armed repression and, and the death of hundreds of activists, the uprising itself became like the, the highest goal of it to honor the shuhada, right? So there was a discourse around that in Tahrir and this idea that all of these young men, I mean, it, it is also a gender-based violence that it's mainly young men who are shot dead, right? Of course, there have been cases and, and and some some women protesters have been targeted. There's a few cases. Some of some of them has have also been kidnapped. And I think that was a very, uh, I mean, I would say, successful strategy uh, used by the militias and and also the political parties in power because it did actually terrify women and 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 uh, it impacted on, on on the numbers of women that carried on uh, going to Tahrir or to Sahd al Habubi in the Nasriya. So there's something that I'm, I'm thinking of at the moment is how we theorize gender-based violence, given the fact that if we look at, at the uprising, uh, there's, there's, some, there's something that needs to be thought of as well, because I think it's also a gender-based violence, the fact that most of um, the individual, the, the peaceful and unarmed individuals that get killed are, are, are male. And there's, of course, a distribution of labor, uh, like yes, Yasemin said, uh, there were women in kind of non-traditional roles, but there was this idea, and I've heard it a lot among, I mean, uh, young pro men uh, protesters and young women protesters saying that, uh, the, for example, the young men were saying, we, we go to the front line because it was really thought as, as, as kind of a, a war against the system. We go in the front line and we, we, we sacrifice our body for the sake of the society, right? And, and women and, and, and women protesters really acknowledge that as well, very much. So there's something that I, I, I would like to think of too. Um, then just uh, uh, around masculine restoration, it's such a brilliant concept of Denise Condioti. But my understanding, and, and, I, and I don't know what, what you guys also think, is that masculine restoration for, for Denise Condioti is, happens when actually feminist uh, have gained some some territory, right? In terms of legal rights, in terms of political rights, in terms of presence in the public space, and then there's this backlash. And for example, if we think about the rise of you know sexist white supremacist groups in Europe and in in the U.S. and and also in in spaces where actually there has been some gains, uh, some significant gains, and 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 I feel that. In the context of Iraq, uh, because of the successive wars, the sanctions, and all of what we've been talking about, my feeling is that we, we are not yet at the masculine restoration stage, but I, I may be wrong, but this is how I see it. And we are still really very much in the very basic gender bargaining that Denis Condioti described in, back in the 80s, I think. So, um, and a, a point about the future, what I feel is that actually the uprising let's say at the political level, I mean, in terms of short terms, is actually not gonna be very successful for obvious reasons, right? Um, even this call for like elections, etc. I mean, this whole discourse on the democracy and is, is, is really, I think, and people know it and, and, and I, I have no doubt that just as 2018, there will be a huge, um, abstention and in, you know, in the coming elections. So what I see and in terms, to, in terms of gender norms and, and, and relations and, and gender issues is so central is that for me, this uprising is important and its consequences are important on the long terms. And this is why I really see it more as a societal uprising rather than as a political one. 
if we think of political in the narrow sense, right, of elections and, and parties and, and so, and this is very, very important. And the fact that for many women's presence alone, I mean, young women and women from all ages made it sound like the whole society is rising against, you know, the, the system. This is very important because this is opening a new page, a new page in Iraq's uh, societal social history, right? The fact that uh, uh, women were so central to make it uh, wide and uh, uh, to, to, to make the reach of the uprising so, so wide. So I, I think more of the long term in terms of gender representations and the imaginaries and, uh, uh, around gender rather than on the short term, short terms of women participating in elections, etc. So I'll stop here to, to leave space for the questions. Um, please feel free to read from the chat if you, it's available to okay. you and, oh, and answer, choose the questions. I don't think we can take a lot, but I leave it up to the, to the to panelists to choose the questions they want to answer. Okay, uh, so um, let me read them right now. Um, Maybe while you read, I just want to say uh, briefly mm. the, the question about the intersectional experiences. Mm. And I mean, of course, um, having worked on the Kurdish women's movement, I'm very much aware that often when we talk about women in Iraq, we tend to speak more specifically about um, well, what's happening in Baghdad or central and southern Iraq and the situation of um, women in, in the north, in Iraqi Kurdistan, and specifically Kurdish women, there are slightly different, um, you know, challenges and dynamics at place. Um, I guess um, one thing when we think intersectionally is also maybe to rethink our terminology. So, you know, one of the things that I have not felt so comfortable with is, you know, this whole framing of the Arab uprisings. Mm. Because when you think, for example, in 2011, it was mainly in the Kurdish region of Iraq, when you had, uh, you know, massive uprisings, especially, um, I think in February, in March, and I know, you know, the, the Kurdish uh, women and men that I spoke to, mainly, mainly Kurdish women activists, of course, did not feel very, uh, not very pleased with this whole idea of, you know, the Arab Spring. And so I think, you know, as a feminist scholar, I, I think we also need to be conscious of our terminology and there are of course reasons why you know Arab is such an important uh, denominator because it's been very much of course a, a political term vis-a-vis -vis, you know western imperialism but when we sort of really think intersectionally and we think about issues around ethnic religious minorities and one of the um, participants also mentioned of course race and anti-black racism Mm. Uh, then I think we have to be also conscious in, in terms of the terminology we use. Yes, yes, I agree very much. And um, talking about actually in inclusivity and in context, there's a question on uh, the, the kind of uh, to location of the uprising, let's say, in the sense that, yes, I mean, I've emphasized on Baghdad, but uh, it's, as I said in the beginning, it, it was mainly an uprising in the Shia dominated areas of Iraq. So I'm not talking about Iraqi Kurdistan. I'm not talking about the Sunni dominated, uh, Sunni majority areas of, of the country. Uh, and that's very important to notice. And, and as I have emphasized, emphasized, I think it is also a, an urban phenomenon. So, so of course that excludes also <laughs> other, other social groups. Um, there's, a, there's a question about um, the, the Sadrists and, and their, their participation and take control of the square. Um, well, I, I feel that actually the Sadrist movement, uh, because of what happened uh, by the late November and, big, uh, and December as well, um, all the violence that happened in the squares, the uh, Sadris activists going to Tahrir and or to Sahat al Habub in Nasriya or Bil Basra, um, um, attacking activists, physically uh, uh, attacking them. And also just the conservative discourse actually of the Sadris movement was, was really pointed out and denounced by, by many young people uh, during the uprising. Uh, and the attempt to um, appropriate 
the movement uh, uh, was, uh, I mean, was a failure for, for the Sadrist movement. And I really feel that for actually the first time in a way that is significant, the Sadrist movement has really lost Part of its base, I'm not saying it's, it's lost its base at all, but part of its base and, and, and some, uh, um, some, some people who are actually, who used to, to be uh, supporters of this movement uh, um, are, are more critical uh, um, of, of the Sadrist movement and, and, and its leaders since the uprising, the, the kind of hypocrisy, also the contradictory discourse, and, and also the Sadrist movement, I feel, is, is the main reason why this um, uh, uprising refused any type of leadership, any type of, of, of structural organization, because there's, there's this um, knowledge, I mean, the 2015 uh, uh, protest movement was appropriated by the Sadrist movement that formed an alliance with uh, um, uh, the Communist Party that then turned the movement into an electoral list that candidated in the 2018 election. And I think this is the main reason why actually protesters refuse any form of, of, um, of leadership to, to avoid being appropriated by whom the Sadrist movement more precisely. So, so let me see if there's another a uh, question, and I think I'm 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 probably going to end uh, here. I'm just trying to. Uh, oh, there's actually a lot of, of questions that were added very recently. Uh, what kind of sources? Okay. Um, oh, there's there's very wide also wide questions. Um, Mm. Shall, shall, shall we move? Perhaps other panelists would like to pick up uh, questions. There's one particularly, I think, addressed to Nadia, and the other one has to do with NGOs that Yasmin might be interested in, in responding to. Nadia, you want to pick up that? And then we'll come back to Zahra to, to pick up other questions. Mm -hmm, thank you. So, Nadia, and Which one do you think uh, was uh, directed? One addressed to you uh, particularly. Let me see. Um, Uh, just a question for Dr. Ali. Uh, oh, I didn't know. It's not El Ali as well. So perhaps it, it's Zahra, my mistake. Okay, so I, what I see, I'm, I'm trying to summar, summarize a little bit the question uh, in, in maybe one question. So, mm, okay. I mean, maybe I can quickly while you're looking say yes, something please. about <laughs> the issue of gender based violence. I mean, I agree that, you know, we need to be careful and, of course, that men are gendered as well. I guess uh, often what is used interchangeably is uh, sexualized violence and gender based violence. But of course, even when we speak about sexualized uh, violence, we know that men are also at the receiving end of it. Mm. And, and particularly men who, by virtue of their um, not fitting in heteronormativity um, and so we haven't talked about that but we know that when we speak about gender-based violence it was also it has also been the targeting uh, of uh, men who are seen I mean queer men um, and what, what is happening in prisons of course uh, there's lots of sexualized violence also against men that is not being that's even more of a taboo often than when we speak about sexualized violence against women. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, there's there's two questions. So one about the sources about the the, the movement uh, in 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 the fifties. So um, well, th there's actually um, some some literature. Nadia has 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 written on it. Uh, I, I I wrote something on it. There's also. Uh, in terms of um, this discussion about the nationalist and the fem and the, the leftist trend, there's of course Noga Efrati's work is, is very significant. Um, so, and and uh, uh, Belsem, you're asking also a question about the fact that you feel that. Uh, so I think that unlike men targeting one mom, woman is enough to silence other women. Uh, yes, yes, I think so. Uh, but this is also significant. I mean, the fact that. It really shows how much you know gender issues are very central, and, and sexual difference here is very central. Uh, 
So there's also something that um, I came across on this specific issue when interviewing activists or protesters um, who came out of, of uh, being detained. Uh, so they were kidnapped by militias and uh, they, they, they came out a couple of weeks or a few months later, is that there's a specific practice that is uh, also um, uh, done by the militias is that before they release an activist, they make a video of this activist. And in this video, they make the activist say very sexual words, sexualized words and, and talk about sexual issues. And, and uh, so for example, um, unfortunately, uh, uh, one of the, um, I mean, uh, Mari Mohammed, for example, who was released, but later on a few weeks after she was released or a, a month and a half after she was released, uh, uh, there was videos of, of her uh, talking about uh, uh, some sexual um, things that she uh, has done with some political leaders. And this is a specific strategy. There's another also activist that, uh, uh, um, a male activist that was uh, uh, told to say that he is a pimp. He participated in the uprising because he wanted to recruit, recruit young girls to be prostitutes. So this is really a systematic strategy of repression that is being used. Uh, um, and um, I mean, it's, it's, it really shows, it, it's really emphasized this argument uh, uh, in showing the centrality of, of, of gender and, 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 and sexual issues in, in the repression of this uprising. Um, and it's very, very effective, unfortunately. It's extremely effective in silencing uh, activists um, to, you know, for, for, uh, most of them actually, when, when they get, go out, they can't talk, they're too afraid that these videos uh, uh, um, are, are released. Uh, I might jump in and answer the question from Jacqueline about uh, international institutions, so I hope I can do this a bit of justice, um, but just to keep in mind that uh, I think about this question a lot, uh, predominantly from the perspective of how women uh, activists are kind of portrayed at the global stage or when they're, you know, presented as local Iraqi activists and what that means for the women's movement within Iraq, especially. Um, so I guess a lesson for inter international institutions, whether they be uh, foreign governments, kind of bilateral aid institutions or other sorts of organizations, is to be really mindful of, of context when you do any sort of gender analysis. So um, who is presented as a local Iraqi activist at a UN Security Council meeting, for example, may not actually be local in a in a in a sense within the context of Iraq. So you need to be really mindful of the fact that there's a diversity of voices in civil society in the activist world. And there's a lot of disagreement about, um, you know, what the most important causes might be, how to go about solving them. And that nuance tends to disappear when you shift that lens upwards. Specific actors get access to those conversations and many others do not, to the detriment, I think, of, of women's rights overall in Iraq, but also in certain contexts. So when you speak to activists in Basra, for example, um, I think they tend to feel somewhat neglected from these conversations. And this happens mm -hmm. a lot, I think, in some of the, the southern governorates in general, because th the lens is always on the kind of most acute uh, security concern. and you know, with right, of course, but there are many security and conflict dynamics that really shape the day-to-day -day lives of women around the country in very different ways. And a lot of actors that have a lot to say about those dynamics, but that nuance and those activisms and the platforms tend to disappear when uh, we're looking just at the main actors and what they've got to say. So I guess in terms of uh, when you're doing a gender analysis of what happens is to, to kind of be mindful of those nuances and also the diversity and voices that are present there. Mm, yes, thank you so much, Yasmin. I'll take one, the final question actually on the, on the chat and then we can perhaps um, uh, end it and you, you guys can, can add um, something if you, if you would like. Is there's a, there's a question on, on the, uh, the, this idea of a sh uh, the Martin, martyrdom and martyrology <laughs> associated with the uprising. And, and this is indeed a very significant feature of the uprising. What I, what I try to analyze as the 
production of an imaginary space and not imaginary as representation, but more as a, a in, in the deeper level, it's uh, um, as, as a cosmology. And the fact that uh, the uprising and, and the martyrs of, of the uprising has been placed kind of in the continuation of this idea of the martyrdom of Al Hussein uh, uh, and, and this, this kind of universal uh, uh, um, uh, quest for justice and, and uh, is, 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 really, is, is really interesting uh, in, in, in the kind of uh, terminology and in, in also the, the, the discursive narrative of the uprising and placing it within this tradition. There's also a very interesting connection that are being made uh, between um, the 91 uprising, uh, especially in, in southern city, for example, Bil Basra or in Nasriya, uh, there are uh, um, um, religious, so Latmiyat, religious songs that were used during the 91 uprising against Saddam Hussein uh, that were uh, that are used by the younger generation, young people who you know who. Who were born after actually the uh, the nineties, or were very young children in the nineties, and they, they were used against uh, the the political establishments and the post two thousand and three system. So that I think deserves a lot of research because it's it it it's really uh, um, I, I think um, connecting between struggles that maybe we would have thought are disconnected uh, in using this religious imaginary. Well, I, uh, I, we've been alerted by Amanda that we can't go on uh, with this wonderful discussion. I want to thank all of you for attending for, and uh, for your questions. And I per particularly want to thank all of the panelists and, and Zahra for, uh, for this very uh, enlightening uh, discussion on women's activism. So um, thanks, Tari, for putting this together. And uh, we hope to see you all at some other point that another uh, webinar that uh, Tari organizes. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>